Hey, morning church. Welcome to church. Come on. And would you... And uh, good morning to those, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching, good night, whenever you're watching, welcome to you watching online, and I really pray you'll be blessed this morning. I'm excited about the message I've got today. I think it can be life-changing if you choose to receive it, so thank you for coming and joining us, and for the rest of you, I hope it'll be life-changing. Would you like to pray with me? Heavenly Father, will you give us fresh eyes this morning? Will you give us the eyes of Jesus? to help us to become more like him, but to see what he sees and to respond the way he wants us to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, two weeks ago was so precious. We had three powerful, powerful testimonies at the baptism. And if you missed that, don't miss church. And, um, and last week we had uh, uh, David and Greta and that was a great weekend and this Sunday night's online if you would like to listen to that it's not on audio, video but it's on audio and the week before that I spoke about comparison and I had an awful lot of feedback a uh, good feedback uh, not a lot of fan mail but some good feedback um, on that and so I kind of want to build on that again today but in a different direction and uh, so if you've got your Bibles there uh, turn to Luke chapter 10 or your iPad or whatever you've got it on Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And we're going to look at a parable this morning that Jesus told in response to a question from a religious big shot. Have you ever met a religious big shot? Okay. And um, it starts off like this in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 29. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus. That's a dumb idea. (laughs) By asking him this question. I love Jesus because he always asks the question back. Have you noticed? Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied with a question. What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Then this guy does something that I won't say you do, but I do. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And this is how I read into this. I want to do just enough to get over the line, but I don't want to do an ounce more. Is anyone, apart from Colin? Okay, okay. I want to do the absolute minimum to get over the line. Like, you know, I've got to sit an exam. What have I got to do to get 50%? (laughs) Who likes studying? Nah, okay. And Jesus, define my neighbor. Who do I have to love? And then Jesus tells this powerful, powerful parable. Luke 10 verse 30. Jesus replies with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And this was a dangerous road in in this time. And he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest, or we could put pastor in there if you want to, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. So instead of going to help, maybe he was just checking his phone, and, uh, and, and you know, he didn't sit, know what was going on, so he just crossed the road. And then it says, this is the New Living Translation, a temple assistant, now these are Levites, uh, Levites administered, so this, this is kind of like working in church, he's an he's a, um, assistant pastor, whatever. He, he walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed to the other side. And I think what we get here is a very powerful illustration of a word called apathy. It's a situation where I can make a difference, but I don't want to get involved. And now fast forward 2,000 years, with our media that we have today, 
we hear a lot of bad news and we hear it instantly. And there's new article after article, and there was not long back there was a church bombing, and there's ISIS beheadings, and there's hurricanes, and there's earthquakes, and there's world disasters. Or sometimes you'll just see an article maybe in the Herald or something, and it's a, a family raising a give a little page for a little kid that's got cancer, and they need to raise, you know, 120,000 to get to the states because the drug's not covered here, you know. And and um, and you kind of in that moment, I'll just talk about me, okay? Because this isn't you, okay? <laughs> And um, you can start dismissal proceedings after church. And um, you kind of move for a moment, and then three minutes later, you're kind of just back to your comfortable world. world. And, and you've forgotten about what you've just heard, and you go, well, what's wrong with me? And why in the world can I not care about, why in the world can I not heard about something for more than a few minutes, and then before I, you know, before I cross to the other side of the road? and drift back into my comfortable life. And, um, and I've noticed in culture that apathy is now slipping into culture and it's also slipped into the church. I didn't say it was going to be a fun Sunday. Uh, apathy simply means lack of interest, lack of enthusiasm, a lack of concern. And just like comparison, it is so destructive and uh, it's destructive in family, it's destructive in marriage, it's destruction in community, and it's destructive in church. Do I really want to get involved? This is going to take some effort. This is going to be hard. Uh, this is going to cost me. So how do we deal with apathy? Because I never want it to slip into this church, and I never want it to slip into my life. Um, it's going to get messy. In this situation, it might be dangerous, um, they, you know, they, they need me back at the temple. Um, there's a prayer meeting to organise. Uh, I'm very busy. Um, I know he's in bad shape, but I, I really don't want to get involved. Ha, have you heard the term the nah generation? Well, you're going to hear it this morning. <laughs> the nah. You got to practice nah. Online, practice nah. Nah. The nah generation. I talked to a board of trustees member and he was just frustrated that to, to get people to get involved and just to help in a secular kind of setting, but then get slaughtered on social media because they, you didn't tick their box. Well, why don't you get involved? Nah. Why don't you join the parking team? Nah. Why don't you join the setup team? Nah. Why don't you come to the 6, 9.30 prayer meeting? Nah. Why don't you join the worship team? Nah. Why don't you join the preaching team? Nah. <laughs> Why don't you join the pack-down team? Nah. Why don't you go and help build the office? Nah. Why don't you help in gala day? Nah. Go and help Christmas boxes? Nah. Have I made my point? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nah. <laughs> What would it do? What would it take for you and I to actually start to care the way Jesus did? Well, why don't, why don't we care the way Jesus wants us to? And I've just chucked a couple of thoughts down. One of the things I wonder is if the volume of information that we are now exposed to has dumbed us down. What do I mean by that? Well, I have a, a, a cell phone. It's got two news apps on it. I get news feeds and there's little beep notifications and doot, 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 you know. And oh, I've got to check out. I've got to know what the news is. And then I've got TV one, TV three, and and you know, and, and this item's the hot news for three days. And then they've moved on to the next one, and it's that's forgotten about. Um, a great example was the the bomb blast in Beirut. It was right centre front of our. And then like three, four days later, moved on. And it was great to uh, you know, help be involved and see some church mission stuff get in there and just jump right in there. Um, and you, you read these situations, oh, there's another earthquake, there's another famine, there's another explosion, there's another cyclone, there's another tough situation, there's another tragedy. Well, it's just another tragedy. It's just another earthquake. It's just another tornado. It's just another bombing. And sometimes, why, why, why don't we care? Well, is the volume of information we're being exposed to one thing? Number two, do we feel unable to actually make a difference? 
last part of our vision statement. The truth is, I think we actually do care, but it, you, you think doing something about it's beyond you. Who am I? I'm only one person. Uh, I don't have a lot of money. Uh, how do I get there? How can I make a difference? Besides, I'm in the middle of my apprenticeship. Besides, I've, I've got a family to look after. I've got a job. I've got a mortgage. Um, what, why is it that we don't care like the way Jesus called us to care? Well, the volume of information is overwhelming. Um, perhaps we feel we can't make a difference. This is the one I think really hits me. We are blessed with comfort, which also can be a Say it with me, church. A curse. We are so Im- Im- incredibly blessed with comfort in New Zealand. And if you've been to a third world country, you will uh, understand what I mean. You know, here in New Zealand, I can just click a few buttons and the groceries arrive. And we've got a little box on our kitchen table. Google, Alexa, And bring me the remote. And I can ask Alexa or Google, could you play uh, Credence Clearwater Revival, please? Could you play? Uh, I ask a question. I don't even have to leave my chair. And she answers. Not Anne, she throws something. (laughs) Actually, uh, I just let you into our word, a little personal here. Um, she, she rang me on her way to church. She just received a phone call. Uh, her uncle, who we, we, we knew this was close, was, who died this morning, and she's in, she's in tears telling me. And, and what you don't understand is that's her last link to her mum. And she said, how am I going to get up and lead worship? Wow. That's the caliber of that girl. And when I get home, she will throw something. I'm proud of you, sweetheart. You're awesome. You don't let anything knock you down. I can just flick on Netflix and just binge watch television and just shut the world out. Uh, Is it possible that uh, the more comfortable our lives become, we just get a little bit less concerned about others? And during COVID, well, I can just watch church online. I don't have to turn up and serve. Talking to a, someone last week, big church in Auckland, a whole chunk of their people haven't come back. Well, it's easy in your jammies, and your coffee. And you don't have to do anything. That's not church. So we're both, we, we are both blessed with and cursed with comfort. So I want to give you a couple of keys this morning before I finish. How do we stop apathy coming in? How do we break out of the nah generation? How do we guard against apathy? Well, here's my, here's my thought. Constantly, consistently, consistently expose yourself to something that creates a healthy discomfort. Does that make sense? There's a lot of words there. Consistently expose yourself to something that, that creates a healthy discomfort. Every single of, of, of you, one of you here is listening right now, including you online, you've, you've been hurt at some time by something. And what happens is we, we hope that we get through that and then we go back to normal. And you can visit a third world country where there's just total poverty and I've got a couple of photos to put up to show you. Um, in, in Indonesia and another place called Kuching um, and uh, you just flick the lights and I'll just put those up uh, Paul just, just put. so like that's home and what you can't see is the pigs underneath and all the sewage just goes underneath and all the plastic goes underneath and that pipe the pipes just go into the river and that's a big river and on the other side of this is the Hilton Hotel and these boats come down at night with big drag nets and drag all the rubbish down the river a bit further, then come back and wait till the next day. And uh, got, got another one there? Muscovy ducks. Whoever, God, why did you create those? Uh, next one. 
And it's like these animals are walking through the houses. They just throw all the rubbish out, the things, the sewage and all that just goes on the floor and then just, and all the waste and it just goes down. The, one more, I think. It's like, there's a pipe. You can see the pipe. The pipes just go into the river. And you get really, a light thanks Paul. You get really moved by that. Oh, that was Kuching. Um, you get really moved by that and then you get home and just go back comfortable and and like well, well how can I make a difference um, you know you're back home and then you've got bills to pay and you're trying to keep my job and I, I need to upgrade my phone oh I'll just scratch my new Nikes <laughs> oh, these are actually Essex <laughs> That's okay. and you just drift back does anyone know what I'm talking about okay right okay otherwise I'm a bit of an idiot aren't I well, you already knew that. And, and you drift back because, you just, because we're not constantly exposed to something that's a healthy discomfort. So what I mean by that, you, you put yourself around something that actually moves your heart. And I tell you what, when you became a believer and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you, God lit something up in you that's not lit. What you carry isn't what I carry. What lights you up isn't what's going to light the person up necessarily sitting next to you. He's, he's given you a God-given um, stirring. To, and you're going to see something and you're going to say, no, nah, and then you're going to look over there, oh. It's, it's, it, that's how the church has got to work. And that way you cover the basis. And, uh, and we sing that song, you know, well, well, you know, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. And if you're around enough, it, 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 and if you're around something enough, your heart starts to break. And you look and say, okay, I'm not okay with this. And I know my God cares, and he put me on this earth to make a difference. And um, this is my watch, and I'm going to make a difference. And when you're constantly exposed to something that creates a healthy discomfort, suddenly apathy cannot exist in that environment. Amen, church? Apathy won't establish in your heart. And how do we overcome apathy? We consistently expose ourselves to something that gives us a help, healthy discomfort. And we, we, in fact, this is what the Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul uh, was originally named Saul. And, uh, and then when the early church birthed, Christ resurrected from the grave, the Holy Spirit poured out and the church started amongst the Jews. The church was Jewish for the early days. Paul, uh, a very important religious man, he took exception to this and he started beating and, and, and actually killing and locking up these new people, we call them Christians, called people of the way. And then, and then Saul, as he was called, had a radical encounter with Jesus. I pray you have a radical encounter with Jesus. And immediately this guy is totally transformed. And, uh, and then he went from like, Christian hater, early church hater to trying to wipe this church out, to wipe out the people of the way. And he became one of the boldest Jesus sharing gospel moving people that has ever lived in the history of the world. And so Paul was constantly exposed to something that was a healthy discomfort. And listen carefully to what he writes in Romans chapter 9. One of the most boldest, most outward focused statements in all of the New Testament. He says in Romans 9 verses 1, with Christ as my witness... I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. And you can, you can feel the anguish in his heart. And then he says, I would be willing to be forever cursed cut off from Christ if that would save them. Oh, there's some passion in there. God, your heart is broken for these people, then so is mine. God, your heart is broken for this situation, then so is mine. And I will do whatever it takes to make a difference. Well, when you care like that, you can't sit around and go, nah, nah. Because life's no longer about you. Life is about taking the gifts God has given you to make a difference in the world. And when you constantly expose yourself to something that creates a healthy discomfort, 
and it moves you out of your comfort zone and it moves you to making a difference. What do we do? What do we do when we start to move in the direction of making a difference? Well, I just want to give you a couple of simple thoughts and then close. I would suggest you just focus on one thing. One cause. One purpose. You may, have, you may have the capacity to go beyond that. You watching online this morning, you may have massive capacity, but just start with focusing on one thing. Amen, church? And it's like, okay, can't help it. This is me. When I'm duck shooting, lots of pellets come out of the gun. But if I don't focus on one duck, they all fly away. You don't, if you don't focus on one thing, yeah. the mess remains. And it's kind of like, and um, as opposed to a rifle, my son came up the other day, oh, a few weeks back, he's bought a new uh, Tika 3. All the ladies know what that is? Yeah, cool. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a makeup. And... Um, and he set this target up, at, uh, he had a range finder, because you've got to have one of those. And it was 200 and I think it was 8 metres, and he said, take a shot, Dad. I've never fired with this gun. And the scope was worth more than the gun. I zoomed it out, and it's a bottle of water, because it looks spectacular. Okay? And I just took this bottle of water. Never fired this gun in my life. One bullet, one focus. And then he, he's like his mother, he had to show off a little bit. And... Um, <laughs> He set a target up at 408 meters. One shot, took it out. Bottle of water. No, no blood was shed in the making of this. <laughs> Bambi lived. <laughs> Have you ever had venison backstrap? Yeah. I learned a new phrase last weekend, South African um, salad. If, uh, if you're South African, put your hand up quickly. Okay, look at them all. Hey, welcome all the South Africans. We love you except for rugby. And um, uh, so go and talk to them after and they'll explain to you what a South African salad is. It's got nothing to do with salad. <laughs> okay. Focus on one thing. Okay, okay. <laughs> There are a number of different, there's a lot of different uh, things on the world, but just ask the Holy Spirit just to, just to nudge you on the one thing, the one area. It might be in those situations, well, actually, there's World Vision are working there and they're working in that village to get clean drinking water and to help them with some sewage and stuff. Well, I feel nudged to help with that. I don't have to go there, I can just help them. Or, um, you know, you might be nudged by um, the, the horrendous uh, human trafficking that goes on in the world. And Anne was just giving me the figures of how many children are missing in the States. It's just like hundreds of thousands. It's like you may be nudged just to, to intercede and pray, and you are a valuable, valuable uh, part of the church if you're that. Um, you know, you may have lost a family member with cancer, and you might think, hey, you know what, I'm going to help with Daffod all day, and I'm going to be a collector. Doesn't have to be, you don't have to have, to have a spectacular lights, it can be very simple. In fact, no one could even see it. Um, you, you know what? Have you ever thought about visiting a rest home and just sitting and talking to people and hearing their stories? And you might get to tell them about Jesus. You may be student ministry at a college or a university and or you may love hanging with teenagers and youth and you just like love to help them find their faith because you, you don't want them finding their faith on their parents' faith. It doesn't end well. They've got to find their faith. Uh, it may be an overseas mission in, in Mount Hope and on that trip I just showed you, we went to the school, fantastic school and they were doing buildings and building schools and there was another church from Tauranga coming up and I thought, man, this would be a cool project for our builders. So I thought, okay, let's give them some practice. Let's knock an office up and then the ones that do that, we'll send them up to um, uh, Borneo, Mount Hope and all you've got to do is have an east wing hammer and um, a few tools no, no guns. And you, you know, and you help knock up a school for the orphans. Uh, we will, we'll have to wait till planes get flying again, maybe. You know, and you've been to some part of the world and the community in a village and you kind of, your heart just drifts back there and I think, what can I do? Um, you may be just starting a small group 
That's significant. Leading a small group and and helping believers grow deeper in Jesus. Um, Helping men and women find freedom from addiction. I was talking to a pastor in Wangarei this week and he's just, he's been on a part-time staff and he's just moved into a a, a drug rehabilitation center. And you could tell when he was talking to me, it was just, he was lit up. This, This was his, you know, this was his, moment this was his you know just he, he'd been doing lots of things but he just started doing this and he just really related guy to, got to the guys there and and just you know he was making a difference and when you make a difference something lights up yeah. okay you may look it can be as simple as just doing a garden and vegetables and maybe teaching your neighbor and help them set up gardens and vegetables just the thing and you do it with the love of Jesus there are lots of things um that catch our attention but only a few things will catch your heart focus on one of them and it's no accident that something winds you up focus on one thing focus on something and you know what really you can take a big breath out here you don't have to start it why reinvent the wheel if someone else is already doing it actually I can support them, I can pray for them, I can send them $10 a month, I can do, you're making a difference. You don't have, don't reinvent the wheel. I, I get a little frustrated, I think, well, you know what, you guys are doing that, why you're doing that, why don't you guys just get together? Anyway. Don't have to start something, just get along with someone that's already doing it. Partner with others who just love you to help. You know, that we do that as a church. Rather than starting new things, we'll partner, we'll partner with the um, thing in Manganaroto. Um, OCS. OCS. You know, we'll partner with them. And they, their food bank was run out of money one day, and uh, so we could chuck some money in there. Thank you. And, uh, and so people got food parcels. It's like we don't have to do everything. Um, it just You can join those who are doing it, and then just stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Great example is Jesus. Why did Jesus come again and again? He told us. He said, He came, He came, He said it in different ways, but He said the same thing. He said, uh, Why did Jesus come? I came to seek and save the lost. He didn't come for the righteous, He came for the sinners. He, 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 didn't, he came that they would have life and have life more abundantly. That's to you. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Why did he come? He came to set captives free. He was incredibly focused on one thing. And you know what? This is why I love this. Passion attracts. And um, passion attracts the attention of others. And so these, these guys and girls gathered around him and they started to advance the kingdom of God. Why? Because passion, focused passion attracts. And uh, apathy repels. Apathy is the most deadbeat emotion on this earth, but passion attracts. And these men are willing, willing to leave their, whatever they were doing, leave their families, leave their jobs. I'm not asking you to do that, but they were just focused. Because why? Because of passion. Well, we're here to show that the Father, the love of the Father, I'm here to help send them free. He focused on one thing. And you can make a difference and it can be huge and it can be just in a little way, but it's just as important. Hear that? And just let the Holy Spirit focus your passion. What am I passionate about? Well, I've got my uh, things that I'm passionate about, but actually I'm passionate about those two signs. That's what I exist for. That's what I want this church to exist for. I want people to know God so I can stand up and hear more testimonies of baptisms, how people, Jesus set people free. I want people to find freedom from whatever in small groups where we take our masks off. I want people to do growth track and discover their purposes. That's what I'm talking about this morning. And then we can go on and make a difference. So what am I passionate about? Those two signs. The, not the signs, but what's on them and what they represent and what they mean. Amen? Amen. And uh, Good. You, you don't just go to church. Become the church. Because that's what we are to do as followers of Jesus. We're not looking, and if you're looking for a church that meets your needs, wrong. We are the church, and we are to meet the needs of the community and beyond. We don't just go to church, we are the church. I, would, I could run around trying to save the world, and I'd probably achieve very little. 
but just with focus and a little bit of passion, you can make a difference. Discover your purpose and make a difference. When, we, when I first came into a, a, a preliminary leadership role here, we were called the uh, Mangawai Interdenominational Church. Try and spell that. And uh, we just kind of gave, in the giving, we gave $10 here, 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 $10. And I said, guys, we're not making a difference. And so we made some really hard calls. And we just narrowed it down so that we could give quite a chunk here, quite a chunk here, and quite a chunk here. And you're blessed. And we're making a difference, not just in New Zealand. Someone's paying for those Christmas boxes. I'll let you know who. (laughs) You. (laughs) You can't say nah, because I've already paid for them. (laughs) Anne is really something on her heart. She's really moved by that sex trafficking industry that's really racked her up. And so she personally, she's sewing financially into that. Focus on an area that you can really make a really diff- a big difference. And I want you to remember that you have an enemy that's going to whisper. Who do you think you are? You can't make a difference. Apathy makes excuses. Passion finds a way. Say it with me, church. Apathy makes excuses, but passion finds a way. And you know what? Passion attracts. Guys, if you're looking for a girlfriend, a bit of passion. <laughs> passion attracts. Not passion, Aaron. <laughs> Apathy is just so ugly. Focus on one thing. Embrace what moves your heart. Remember what Paul said? My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief. My heart is breaking for these people. Notice he presses into what's hurting. Here's the problem. This is a lie that many of us believe. It hurts less not to care. It's easier not to get involved. If I do something, it could cost me. It's it's going to take me some time. You know what I've learned in church life and in community life? You want something done? Ask a busy person. Well, this could hurt me. It's easier not to care. I might, I might get criticized on social media. That's coming, guys. Get ready for it. That's coming for the church. I want to tell you prophetically, that's coming for the church. As we stand up as a church and start to stand against this tide of the pit of hell that's coming, you're going to get criticized. And I was being informed yesterday of some of the things that I, as a pastor I could face if I preached them that I could be prosecuted on and taken to the cleaners. You will not shut Colin up. I didn't hear that rude comment. She said she'd come and visit you. Yeah. (laughs) Embrace what hurts, church. Embrace it and take the flack. If your faith is all about your comfort, you're worshipping a false god. If your, if your faith is about your comfort, you're worshipping a false god. And you'll never serve anywhere, you'll never give anywhere sacrificially, you'll never be moved to pray for others, you'll never fast because that means denying yourself and you don't have to fast food to fast. You just sit around, nah. Can I tell you something? You will miss the blessing of God. Moses, constantly exposed to a healthy discomfort, put his life on the line to rescue the Jewish people out of Egypt. Pharaoh, let my people go. David was, 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 was exposed to a healthy discomfort. And who are you to come against the armies of the living God? And he takes out Goliath. Nehemiah, serving in the palace. Serving in his... He, he loves cleaning up because he gets all the grapes. 
the watermelon, the pen, the Penfolds Grange. Am I allowed to say that? No. Okay, that's fine. Uh, you can't afford it. It's all right. Oh, actually, no. You probably can. Um, he 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 was in comfort. And then 1,300 kilometers away, he heard about a city called Jerusalem where the walls were broken down. You can look it up in the book of Nehemiah. And he asked his king, can I, can I be released? The king said, yeah, and here's my, my credit card. And Nehemiah gets to this trashed Jerusalem, but he's focused on one thing, rebuilding the walls. And I'm not coming down off the ladder till I've got the job done. There were people that hated him. There were people that posted stuff on Instagram and social media about him. There were people that wanted to kill him and he just stayed focused. And his passion, he gathered around Dad's army effectively and they got the job done. Focused passion on one thing. Jesus walks up and he overlooks Jerusalem and he breaks down and he's weeping. And if Jesus breaks down and weeping, you take notice. And he says, these people are a sheep without a shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. Come on, we've got a reason. And I would rather hurt with a purpose than exist without one. If you've still got your Bibles open, Turn back to Luke 10. We have to move out of our comfort zone, otherwise apathy moves in. So the priest crossed to the other side of the road. The temple assistant, the Levite, he walked right on by. Let's pick it up in verse 10, a chapter Luke 10, verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and Penfolds Grange and bandaged them. Now you know what Penfolds Grange is. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now Jesus says, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who attacked, who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said to Causeway Church, now go and do the same. Amen.